Joe speaks nine languages. He travels the world. He's helped Messianic Jewish believers all over the world. Uh, churches in Korea and in China and Japan, in Austria, Bulgaria, Argentina. Um, I could go on and on and on. Uh, but Joe is headed to Cuba next week uh, to work with uh, Messianic believers there. Uh, Joe is a gift. I think he's got an important message to talk to us tonight about uh, the Apostle Paul. And so I turn it over to my good friend and my rabbi, Joseph Shulam. So I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm going to speak about the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is an enigma. Why is he an enigma? Because for Jews, Christianity wasn't started by Yeshua, by the Messiah. It was started by the Apostle Paul. And all the evils of Christianity are attributed to the Apostle Paul. The antinomianism, which means against the, the, the law, and against the commandment, and all these things are attributed to Paul. So I spent 35 years studying the Apostle Paul. And then I wrote several commentaries that mostly have to do with the Apostle Paul. Now we are very lucky, because the most important thing that you do when you start studying something or reading a book ought to be that you become acquainted with who is the writer. Because who is the writer is as important as the material inside the book. Because if some fool is the writer, uh, you're not going to give proper weight to the content of the book, right? And we're very fortunate. We have the Apostle Paul handing us at least several times his personal card. If you come from Asia, from Korea, and Japan, and China, the first thing that you do when you meet somebody, you pull your card out, and you bow down and give your card. Well, the Apostle Paul gave us several times his card. He tells us who he is. And so it's very, very important, but we don't have time now to go through all these examples. But I do want to give you several of these places where the Apostle Paul tells us who he is and what he does. And you can write them down and check them out later. The first time that we find from the Apostle Paul who he is from his own, so to speak, his own mouth, is in Acts chapter 22. The first five verses of Acts 22 are Paul's address to the crowd in Jerusalem crowd that was hostile. They wanted to lynch him, to beat him up inside the temple court. And Roman centurion uh, takes him up the stairs to the porch of the fortress Antonia, and Paul demands to address the crowd, and he addresses them in Hebrew. That's in Acts chapter 22, the first verses. Now, I'm not going to go through this card but I do want you later as homework. I'm a teacher, you know. You have to have homework. As homework, I want you to read this text from Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Paul tells you where, who, who was his teacher and, and what he did. And uh, how he became a believer in a short version. And uh, in chapter 25, verse 8, Paul is now in Caesarea. And in Caesarea, he's uh, speaking to a group of judges, lawyers, Sanhedrin members that came from Jerusalem to Caesarea to accuse Paul in front of the Roman governor of Judea. And so, I just want one, because of the shortness of time, I just want to, one verse from chapter 25 of the book of Acts, verse 8. 
One verse, Paul's defense in front of the Sanhedrin and in front of the Roman governor. It says, verse 8, while he was answering for himself and defending himself, this is what Paul said, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. So what do we learn from this text? Paul is saying, both to the Jewish leadership that came from Jerusalem and to the Romans, that he has done nothing wrong according to the law of the Jews. Now what does this mean in practice? I wish I had 20 hours. Usually the seminar about Paul lasts 20 hours, but I have only one hour, so I have to be quick. What does it mean? I didn't do anything against the law of the Jews. It means that Paul never ate a BLT sandwich. <laughs> That's what it means. That Paul kept the Sabbath laws and the holidays and the dietary laws and the ritual laws in the temple. That's what it means. So I believe Paul didn't lie. I believe Paul spoke the truth, not only in this place, we'll see several other places. He spoke the truth, which means he was a kosher Jew. And he did, this is after his third missionary journey. This is after he did most of his work, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles in Asia Minor, in Greece, and, and in Crete, and in other places where he was. He told the truth. I didn't do anything against the law of the Jews which means that he was a kosher Jew and never stopped being a kosher Jew. So any theologians who say that Paul allowed himself and other Jews to eat pork and to desecrate the Sabbath, either Paul is lying or they're lying. I choose to believe Paul. One more place. We're going to go one more place. There is. Lots of places that Paul talks about it, but the last words of the Apostle Paul in the end of the book of Acts. Acts 28, verse 17. Paul has been traveling for six months. He was wrecked twice on the journey, once in Crete, once in Malta. He was snake bitten in Malta. He arrives, I imagine, very tired to Rome. He arrives to Rome, and in Rome, I'm reading to you now from verse 17, chapter 28 of Acts. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, Though I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. All right, here we have the Apostle Paul. He arrives in Rome three days later without cell phones. He sends a message to the leadership of the city of Rome. Now, Rome is the capital of the Roman Empire. The Jewish community in Rome, we know a lot about it. It was a formidable community, very powerful community with very important people, people that were close to the governing powers of the Roman Empire. Paul invites them to come, and they come. Look, if I go now to Washington, D.C., and I send a message to the Jewish senators, come and meet me in my hotel, will they come? They won't come. Why? They don't know me. They're busy people. The leadership of the Jewish community in Rome hears the invitation by the Apostle Paul to come to talk to him, and they come to talk to him. How come? They come to talk to him because he was very famous. What made him famous is not his faith in Yeshua. It was his life before he met the Lord on the Damascus Road. He was 
the attorney general of the high court in Jerusalem. He was a student of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the Supreme Court top judge. And when Paul studied under Gamaliel, he didn't learn macrame or knitting. He studied law. And he was a lawyer, very famous lawyer. You don't send just any Tom Dick or Harry to arrest people in another country unless he is a government official, unless he has diplomatic license, unless he is known internationally and respected to go to another country and arrest people and bring them back to the land of Israel. So Paul was very well known in the Jewish community in Rome, and that's why the leaders of the Jewish community in Rome pack up and go meet Paul wherever he's staying in Rome. And what does he tell them? He tells them, very similar to what we saw in chapter 25, he says, I have done nothing against our nation, against our people. Not only against our people, I have done nothing. I have done nothing to break or to abrogate the customs of our forefathers. Or fathers, depends how you read it. Yeah? Which again, it means that Paul remained uh, until the very end of his life and ministry a faithful Jew. People say Paul converted on the road to Damascus. Did Paul ever say, I'm a Christian? He never said, I'm a Christian. Let's see how Paul, and, and one of the big problems with Paul and his letters is that he writes his letters against an unknown group of op opposers to Paul. They, people were his enemies, they opposed him, and they opposed his apostleship. That's why in every letter he starts, I am the Paul, a prisoner of Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's got to reaffirm his authority as an apostle. And that's why, like in Galatians, he spends two chapters like a lawyer defending himself and his position as an apostle and his authority as an apostle. So Paul is in Rome. He's telling the, the leaders, I've done nothing against our nation, nor against the tradition of our forefathers. I believe he's telling the truth. But he had opposition. And one more card, one more card from the letter of the Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. That's going to be the end of this card because of lack of time. But Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to just jump, again because of lack of time, to verse 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, starts his, def his defense against his opposers with these words, beware of dogs, <laughs> beware of evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Imagine your pastor with a 40-year smile and the sons of belt pants standing there and calling some of the people who are giving him hard time dogs from the pulpit. <laughs> Evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. That's the definition that Paul gives to those who are opposing him. Verse four, no, verse three, excuse me. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Who, who is he talking about? Who is this group in the plural, we, that he's talking about? He says, we are the circumcision. If you follow Paul's letters, when he talks about the circumcision, he's talking about one group and one group only, the Jews. He says, we the Jews. You can confirm this point by looking at 
part of your homework in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 through 23. And if you want, the opposition to the we is the you, and that the Gentile believers, you can confirm that by looking at Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 and on down the, t the, the chapter, where it says, you Gentiles. And he always, when he refers to the Gentiles, he goes with you. That's an interesting tip that will help you understand all of Paul's letters much better. So he says, we the circumcision, the Jews, we worship God in the spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It is the exact opposite of the picture that Christians have of Jews. Christians have of Jews that the Jews are proud that they're in the flesh. There is nobody that has less self-confidence about their flesh than the Jews. The Jews may appear as proud and cocky and self-confident as a defense of their lack of self-confidence. And Paul here states it very clearly. And he continues, verse 4, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have even more than him. You want to come? Paul is inviting his, op his opposers for a competition, a spitting match. He says, You guys want to play that game about confidence in the flesh? Let's talk about it. Verse 5 I was circumcised on the eighth day. Look, if I now tell another Jew I was circumcised on the eighth day, what is he going to tell me? I was also circumcised on the eighth day. Right? That means that if I put a mirror in front of this question, I was circumcised on the eighth day, it means that the other guy, the opposition, was not circumcised on the eighth day. Otherwise, the argument has no value. Right? The argument has only value that I was circumcised on the eighth day if my oppos opposers did, was not circumcised on the eighth day. Continue. I am of the stock of Israel. If, if my opposer is a Jew, I'm of the stock of Israel, he said, I'm also of the stock of Israel. What's the argument? This argument is only valid if the other side is not from the stock of Israel. If he was a Japanese that converted to Judaism, he may be a Jew religiously, but he's not an Israelite. He remains a Japanese. You understand the argument? So Paul says, I am of the stock of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. Which means that if some a Gentile converts to Judaism, which tribe is he going to be? If he's a Korean that converted to the tribe of, to, to, to Judaism, he may be from the tribe of Han, but he's not from the tribe of Levi or Judah or Naphtali or Menashe or any of the 12 tribes. He doesn't have a tribe. Even he converted to Judaism, but he doesn't have a tribe. Continue. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Hebrew is a race. It's not a religion. Okay? If he says I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, talking to another Jew, he's also a Hebrew. Whether he's the tribe of Levi, or the tribe of Judah, or any of the other 12 tribes, he's an Israelite. He's a Hebrew. But if he converted racially, he's not going to be a Hebrew. Okay? He continues, concerning the law, I am a Pharisee. Oh, Paul is a Pharisee. Must be a hypocrite, right? <laughs> well, that's how Christians are trained to think when they think about Pharisees. But actually, we're all Pharisees. Any Christian that is a disciple of Jesus Christ is a Pharisee. If you believe 
that you can discern the will of God by reading the Bible, by reading the Word of God, you're a Pharisee. Because the Pharisees are the ones who introduced that revolution long before Martin Luther. If you believe that you have a text, and from that text you can discern what is God's will for you, you're a Pharisee. You don't have to be a hypocrite, but you're a Pharisee. If you believe in miracles, you're a Pharisee. If you believe that there are angels, you're a Pharisee. If you believe in the resurrection from the dead, you're a Pharisee. So Paul says, I'm a Pharisee. Not all the Pharisees were hypocrites. There were some hypocrites and some not. Like not all the Christians are hypocrites, but there are some who are. Uh, there are. In every denomination, there are some who are. So, Paul says, I am concerning the law, I am a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I walk blameless. Wow. I can't say that. I can't, I'm a good Jew. A good Israelite from the tribe of Levi. But I can't say that concerning the law and the commandments of the law, I walk blameless. Why? Most of my life, before I believed in Jesus, I ate everything. Possum. In Georgia, I was in Georgia Christian School in Valdosta, Georgia. Believe it or not, I ate possum. <laughs> and rattlesnake. And a lot of pork. And I enjoyed every bite of it. <laughs> and especially all the lobsters that I caught in Biscayne Bay in Miami when I lived down there. So I can't say that I walk blameless according to the commandments of the law. But Paul said that. Now, I'm going to continue in a minute, but I want to summarize this point. Traditionally, Since Martin Luther, and even since the early church fathers, the opponents of Paul were described as the Jews. The Jews were those that were opponents of the Apostle Paul. Yes, in one or two cases, especially in Ephesus, the Jews opposed him. Why? He was taking away their business. You can do anything to a Jew, but don't take away his livelihood. <laughs> yeah? So there were times that Jews opposed Paul, but not on spiritual ground, on business ground. These people that are his opponents that he calls dogs and mutilators of the flesh, they are not Jews. They are Gentiles who converted to Judaism. They're Gentiles who decided that they want to be circumcised and be Jews. Why they made that decision, I can understand. The majority of the church was Jewish. The culture of the church was Jewish. They were not, and they didn't want to feel like second-class citizens. They didn't have to feel like second-class citizens. But when you're in a minority, you always feel that way. And that's true about every minority in every country, in every case. Even if you have a doctorate from Harvard and you're a part of a minority, you still feel like you're second class. That you don't get your fair share of respect or your fair share of anything. So that was the case sociologically that was happening in the early church. And not only in the early church. In every synagogue in the diaspora, the same thing happened. How do I know that? Because I know the Jewish literature of the period. All the synagogues had this problem with Gentiles who wanted to be super Jews. The Messianic movement in America and in Israel has the same problem now. We've got a lot of Gentiles who want to be super Jews. They tie their tassels on their belt loops, and they have the biggest kippahs 
yarmulkes in Yiddish. Yeah? And they use, they interlace their southern bra with a few Hebrew words out of context. <laughs> That's true in every Messianic uh, community that I know in America. I was just telling uh, some of my friends about a case in New Mexico a few years back when the Messianic movement had a, a, a regional conference there. And there was an Israeli guy and his family, a Moroccan Jew from north of Israel, that for the first time went to a Messianic conference. And he sees this great big guy with a big fur hat like the orth super Orthodox wear, black clothes, everything. And he asked me, is this guy Jewish? Well, I said, look at that, he's dressed like a Jew. Go f find out. <laughs> so he goes and he was shorter than I am, this Moroccan Jew. And he goes and he tugs on the guy's sleeve and he starts speaking to him in Hebrew and the guy turns to him and says, hello brother, the Lord just hadn't given me that language yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, that kind of a phenomena happens now, and it happened in the first century also. There were Gentiles who wanted to be Jews, want to be Jews. And they were opposing Paul. Why were they opposing Paul? Because Paul didn't think that it is right for Gentiles to convert to Judaism, because it waters down the work of the Messiah. It waters down the promises and the prophecies of Isaiah that the house of God will be a house of prayer for all nations. Because of that, Paul opposed Gentiles converting and he opposed Jews assimilating. I'll just read to you one text from 1 Corinthians 7, but, but, but you should read the full text uh, as homework. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 7. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him continue to walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. I ordain in all the churches, not all the Americans understand that. It means I am legally making an ordinance, a law, for all the churches. It's a command, a law, a legal command for all the churches. What is the command? Verse 18, was anyone called while he was circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Again, I'm going to read that text. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised such a super glue has not been invented yet. <laughs> As anyone called uncircumcised, let him not become circumcised. This is a law that Paul is legislating for all the churches. Let each one remain in the calling that God called him. So that's why Paul, not only Paul, if you go to an Orthodox rabbi now, you say, I'm a Gentile, I want to become a Jew. He say, why? You don't need to be, I want to get saved. You don't need to become a Jew to get saved. We have enough problems of our own, we don't need your problems. <laughs> Jewish rabbis are not in a hurry to convert anybody unless there are some crook rabbi that will charge you for the conversion. <laughs> but legally, a rabbi should not charge for a conversion or for circumcision or for any, any of, the, of his services. There is no such a thing as a price for conversion. If you have to pay, the rabbi is a crook. So, that's Paul's position. His position is, you don't need to be, become a Jew to be saved. But these opponents of Paul, that we read about them in Galatians, in, in all of the letters, 
These opponents of Paul wanted to boast in the flesh. That's the language that Paul uses in his letters, especially Galatians. They wanted to boast in the flesh, and in Galatians chapter 6, he tells you two reasons why they wanted to boast in the flesh. One is to escape persecution. The other one is to boast in the flesh, to show off, I am a Jew also. Look at me, I am a Jew. Yeah. That's why they wanted to convert to Judaism. And many of them converted and rejected the Messiah as a result of their conversion. This happens today too. What does it mean to escape persecution? From Galatians chapter 6. Judaism was a religio licita. It was a legal religion in the Roman Empire. When Rome conquered the nation, they accepted the local religion of the local population as a part of the legal religion of Rome. So Judaism was a legal religion. But what was forbidden? There were two kinds of religions forbidden. Secret sects. New religions. They were forbidden. So here you have a Gentile Roman centurion. And he ran around with his buddies and went to the temples and to the Vestal Virgins and you know, went carousing with them. And suddenly, he stops. He no longer goes to the pagan temples. He no longer runs around with his buddies. He is now changed. He changes his demeanor, his, his, his behavior, his dietary customs. He joined a, a sect. He joined a new religion. It's against the law for a Gentile to convert. Islam, until today, has the same law. It's called minya in Islam. Yeah, if they conquer a nation, they allow the people to remain Muslim, I mean, to remain whatever they are until they're forced to convert to Islam. But if somebody changes, a Muslim converts to another religion, he could have his head cut off, even today. So that's why people, Gentiles, who wanted to convert to Judaism so that they'll escape the persecution as people who have joined a secret sect or a new religion that they were not part of it before. And the other one is boasting in the flesh means they wanted to be a part of the in-group. That's what was the, the case. Both of these things are not legal. They're not right. So back to Paul's opponents. Why am I spending so much time on Paul's opponents? Because this is one of the main issues in understanding the Apostle Paul. Who were his opponents? Why were they opposing him? They were opposing him because of this thing that we read in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul says, if you're a Jew, remain a Jew. If you're not a Jew, don't become a Jew. Why? The work of the Messiah is universal. It's universal from the time of Abraham. All of Israel's role in history and in the election of Israel as the chosen people of God was not for the sake of Israel alone. It was always for the sake of all the world. When God called Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, he said, in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that promise is given in chapter 12 and chapter 13 and chapter 15 and chapter 17 and chapter 18 and chapter 22 and repeated in chapter 25 to Isaac and then repeated to Jacob. Israel was not the chosen people of God in order to boast. It was in order to be a light to the nations. And through Jesus Christ, that light of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and King David came to the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is the instrument of God to bring the good news to the world. 
He is the instrument of God to bring the pagans out of paganism and into faith in one God. That's the work of Jesus Christ, and that's the work of the Apostle Paul. He asked the question in Romans 3.29. He asked the question, is God the God of the Jews only? If he's the God of the Jews only, let all the Gentiles get circumcised. I didn't bring my knife today. <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's not the God of the Jews only. He is the God of the Gentiles also. Look at uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 29. It's uh, a fascinating text. I'm reading from verse 12. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is also the God of the Gentiles. He is the only creator we have, and everything in the world was created by him. The Jews, the Gentiles, the blacks, the oranges, the yellow, the red, whoever they are. Everybody was created by God, even the mosquitoes. <laughs> they are lucky that I wasn't God. <laughs> I wouldn't have created them. But God is the God of the Jews and the Gentiles, the same way. Verse 30, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Are they justified in the same way? The Jews and the Gentiles according to this text? No. Why do I know no? I want to teach you. I already gave you one tool to understand the Apostle Paul. The pronouns, you and we. Right? Remember? Now the second tool, the pronouns. The first pronoun is that there is one God justifies the circumcision, the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. By is ek in, in Greek, out of. Through is dia in Greek, through. Why is this the difference in the way we're justified? Because the Jews were justified out of their own history. Jesus is flesh of their flesh, bone of their bone, blood of their blood. And they experienced the salvation history. They, they lived out the salvation history. The Gentiles... God saved, God justified through the salvation history of the Jews. That's why you teach your children about King David. That's why you teach your children about Sam Samson and about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and about the exodus from Egypt and about the do Pharaoh's daughter that saved little Moses from the Nile River. Right? You teach your children these things? That's not a part of your history. Through that history, you were justified through Jesus Christ. So dia is out of ek, the Jewish people, circumcision. And you are dia, through the history of salvation that was experienced by the nation of Israel, you have received the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as your God. You have left Zeus and Athena and Diana and Hera and Ashtarte behind, and now you believe in the God who created the heavens and the earth. That is why it's important to pay attention to the pronouns. And Paul, as a lawyer, is very consistent and very logical, more logical than any of the other New Testament writers because he studied law. And that's why the Apostle Peter, when he talks about the Apostle Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, says what he says about the Apostle Peter, about Apostle Paul. We're going to read from 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, 
looking forward to these things, meaning the history developing toward the end of the world, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and without blemish. And consider that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. In other words, God's patience is waiting for you to get saved. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as it is, as, as by, uh, well, I'm going back. Also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as he has written to you, uh, is the context. This is a very interesting compliment that Peter gives to Paul. It's a classical Israeli compliment. A classical Israeli compliment is, you see a woman with a nice dress, you say, hey sister, what a nice dress you have. Did you buy it in the flea market? <laughs> yeah. That's a classical Jewish compliment. <laughs> Peter does the same thing to Paul. He says, yeah, he has wisdom, but to a measure that God has given to him, limited wisdom. That kind of compliment Peter is giving to Paul here. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Why are they hard to understand? Because he's a lawyer. I have never read anything a lawyer wrote that was easy to understand. <laughs> yeah. And Paul's letters are hard to understand. And they're hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people, you know, the ignorant and, and crazy people, twist to their own destruction, the words of the Apostle Paul. And this has been the history of Protestant Christian theology for 500 years. Yeah, if anybody wants to turn against the Jews, anybody wants to fight with another denomination or a non-denominational denomination like the Church of Christ, they find from the Apostle Paul good text to fight about. Very seldom do Christians fight about the words of Jesus. The big arguments and divisions in the churches are coming from the Apostle Paul. Why do they not use the words of Jesus? We have four, four Gospels. Because most of the preaching in most of the evangelical and Protestant churches comes from the letters of Paul. 70% of the pulpit time in evangelical churches is from the letters of the Apostle Paul. From the Gospels, only 10%. From the other letters in the book of Acts, another 10%. And from the whole Old Testament, 10%. That's the statistics of preaching in evangelical churches in the West. Why? Jesus is hard. He's not so kind. He doesn't teach about grace so much. He says if a tree doesn't bear fruit, bang, put the ax to him. Right? He says if somebody comes to the party dressed with the wrong clothes, unclean clothes, what to do about it? Throw him out into outer darkness. Jesus doesn't talk so much about grace. Paul does. Why does he talk about grace? And to who does he address the grace? He addresses the grace to the poor Gentiles. They don't know better. They weren't raised with the word of God. They were pagan idol worshipers. And at that kind of condition, they need grace. But that grace does not say you don't have to obey God. That grace says you get a ticket to ride and when you get off the train, you still have to pick up your own suitcase. <laughs> you still have to learn to serve, to do good works. That's what that grace is about. So Paul in Peter, is described as somebody, dear brother, beloved brother, 
with wisdom from God to a limited degree. And his epistles and his writings are misunderstood by uneducated and bad people who twist his words to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. That's what the text says. As they do the rest of the scriptures. Okay, the problem already existed in the first century. We are now in the 21st century. The problem still exists. But if you take this simple advice that I'm giving you, pay attention to the pronouns. Second person pronouns, you, in the plural, always means the brothers that came from among the nations, from the Gentiles. We, us, and ours always means the Jewish believers. There may be one exception that I would concede to, but Paul, most of the time, as a lawyer, is giving a very consistent text on these issues. The second advice is pay attention to the prepositions. Logic travels on the prepositions. And if you don't pay attention to the prepositions, you'll miss the argument because the preposition like, shall we say then, which appears in Romans several times, what shall we say then? That's a preposition that raises a straw man so that it can be knocked down and then the real truth comes out. As lawyers, people know that lawyers do the same thing. Yeah. Raise a straw man, take him to the nth degree, to ad absurdum, and then knock him down. So what is happening in, in, to people like Calvin, for example, with all due respect to Calvin and to our Presbyterian brothers and sisters, he didn't pay attention to the, to, to the pronouns of the prepositions. And that's how he misunderstood the predestination issue in the first chapter of Ephesians. If he had paid attention to the pronouns, he would have seen that he's talking about Israel, the Jewish people be predestined to bring the Messiah to the world. And that predestination is in spite of the weakness and sometimes of the sainfulness and sometimes of the deviation of the Jewish people. God used them anyhow. And if God used the Jewish people anyhow, in spite of their shortcomings and rebellious attitudes, he can use you all as well. No matter from which denomination you are, God can use you. And uh, with this I'm going to end because my time is up. I could continue, but I'm asking for grace. But there is no grace. Thank you. Colossians 2, 9 through 11 talks about spiritual circumcision. Is that true for uh, Gentiles? Is it, what's the spiritual circumcision? For Jews and Gentiles both? Spiritual circumcision and the circumcision of the heart is not an invention of Paul or of the New Testament. The, the law of Moses already commands more than one time the Jews to circumcise their heart. If I'm not wrong, somebody check, check me. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, I think it's verse 16. Somebody open Deuteronomy 10, 16. I'll see if I can do it qu quickly as well. No, I need to stay in Colossians. Yes. <laughs> yes, that is correct. 10, 16, what does it say? It says, circumcise your hearts. Right? But... The parallel text to this in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I think it's verse 10, I'm not sure about the verse, but chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. If, says, oh, you done? I will, no, I'm not done. Okay. Uh, the, the, that text in Deuteronomy 30 says, God says, I will circumcise your heart. One is you circumcise your own heart, and the other one is, I will circumcise your heart, in chapter 30. 
The rabbis, of course, that, that for them, that is bread and butter. That there is like one time you do it and one time I will do it for you. 36. That, what? 36. 30, chapter 30, verse 6 uh, in Deuteronomy. So we see that the whole idea of circumcision of the heart is from the law of Moses. So it applies to Jews and to Gentiles equally to everyone. And the argument that you are a son of Abraham and that you got circumcised in the flesh is not an argument that has power of salvation. Circumcision of the flesh is a mark of identity of belonging to the nation of Israel, to the children of Abraham in the flesh. The Jews had to circumcise their heart just like the Gentiles had to circumcise their heart. Just like all of us have to circumcise their heart. Now, the continuation of the text in Colossians, verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Who is he talking about? The Gentiles, you. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By How were you circumcised? By putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Notice what Paul does here. He says to the Gentiles, he says, you were circumcised not with hands of men, but when you gave your life to Christ and you died with him in the watery grave of baptism and you raised into a new life and became a new creation, that is when your heart was circumcised in baptism. That's what the Apostle Paul says here to the Gentiles. But everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, have to have their heart circumcised. Without that, we can't obey God. Yes. By my count, everyone in here has written at least three questions. <laughs> Good luck. So. We're gonna... I have all night if they have all night. Okay. So I'm trying to divide these up to at least make sure we cover each subject area. While we're on the issue of circumcision and the enemies of Paul, if Paul said that those who are uncircumcised should remain uncircumcised, why did he arrange for Timothy to be circumcised? Ah, because Timothy had one parent who was Jewish. His mother was Jewish. And if his mother is Jewish, then he is Jewish. And if he is Jewish, he ought to be circumcised. And he tells us why. Not for salvation. For the sake of the Jews. What does it mean? That if you're going to preach to the Jews, it's worthwhile to be a Jew. If you're going to live with the Jews, it's worthwhile to be a Jew. Yeah. Jew, we are a clannish people. Not as much as the Irish, <laughs> but we have our own clannishness, and we rather, we trust each other much more than we trust you Gentiles. And that's why it's better for a Jew to preach to the Jews and the Gentiles to give him the money to do it. While on the subject, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and following, to the Jews I became like a Jew, to those under the law I became as one under the law, though I am not under the law. Is Paul telling the truth that he isn't under the law? Yes, I believe Paul is telling the truth, but I think that this statement that Paul makes has to be taken as a strategy and not as a law. He is talking about what missionaries and missiologists call contextualization. 
the great missionaries that went to China and to Korea and to Japan and to the Far East, they dressed like Japanese, ate like Japanese with chopsticks, learned the language, and lived with the community that they were trying to reach. They did not become Japanese, but they acted like Japanese in order to identify with the Japanese people. This is true in many parts of the world except in Israel. The Christian missionaries in Israel, very, very few of them contextualize their life, either with the Jews or with the Arabs. Most of them have been there 50 years, never learned the language. Yes. And it's a tragedy. I believe that the best thing, the, the quickest way to have Israel saved is to kick out every Christian missionary out of the land of Israel. <laughs> Jesus is ours. We can deal with Jesus. We can understand Jesus. When I became a believer, I tried to witness to my father. After five minutes, he was patient listening to me and said, stop. He said, what do you think, I'm ignorant? I was born and raised in Europe. Most of my friends were Christian. I went to church with m many times with my friends. I am not interested in Christianity, not because I'm ignorant of what Christianity is. I'm not interested in Christianity because I know what Christianity is. And in fact, I'm going to say it, I, I hit and run. Tomorrow I'm not going to be here, so it's okay. <laughs> the best, uh, quickest way for Jewish people to accept Yeshua as the Messiah is to leave them alone with the gospel. Allow other Jews to, t to speak to Jews. Let the Gentiles speak to the Arabs. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm serious about this because there is tremendous developments in Judaism now. Rabbis are talking about Jesus, writing books. I have a stack of 13, 14 books that have been written, published in the last two or three years, sitting on my desk. From Shmulik Boteach, one of the most famous rabbis in the United States, to Amy Jill Levine, the head of the Department of Religion in Vanderbilt University. Okay, can I, can I be a lawyer for a minute? Sure. Was it a Jew who introduced you to Jesus? When you were, you were teaching the older kids how to smoke and the dad came down on you, was he Jewish? No, but he, he didn't, I already had written a paper about Jesus and about Christianity and got A plus from my Jewish teacher. And the only thing that this Gentile said is, you have to make up your mind who this Jesus is. Is he the biggest crook that ever lived in the face of the earth? Or is he what he says he is? The but Messiah. was he a Gentile so, he was a missionary Gentile. in Israel? He was a Gentile missionary <laughs> in Israel. <laughs> yeah. What's a goy like him doing in a place like that? <laughs> that's that's true, that's okay. true, but but I probably would have done better <laughs> without him. Okay, let's move on. Are Cephas and James not also at times Paul's opponents? Were they requiring Gentiles to take up the customs of Judaism? They were not Paul's opponents. They were his brothers and sisters. But he opposed them to uh, their he, face. Yes, that he does in his defense of his apostleship. And he wants to show that he's got as much authority as Peter has. And on a very minor issue, they were eating with the Gentiles. And they were a little bit afraid of what people will say about them that don't know that they were eating fish and not pork chops. And so, they did something hypocritical. The sin was not eating with the Gentiles. The sin was that they were hypocritical, that they were shamed, ashamed of eating with the Gentiles. And they got up and left 
when they heard that there were people from Jerusalem coming. And so that's, that's like seeing your preacher in the restaurant drinking wine. Yeah? And as soon as he sees that there are members of people that know him coming into the restaurant, he hides the bottle under the table. That's what Peter did, essentially. Okay. In reference to us and you, Ephesians 1. If Ephesians 1 is about Israel, there's your predestination passage, I believe, your yeah. reference to Calvin. Yeah. If Ephesians 1 is about Israel, why does it mention adoption? Ah, very nice. Ephesians 1, give me the verse again. Ephesians 1, hold on, I'll pull up uh, what they may have been talking about. I can... I, I, Ephesians 1, verse 5. All right. Notice what it says. Verse 4. Just as He chose us, the Jewish people, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us, the Jewish people, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What does it mean? It means that when God chose Abraham, why did he choose him? He chose him because of chapter 11 of Genesis. Abraham is chosen chapter 12. What happened in chapter 11? Humanity rebelled against God in the Tower of Babel. Before that, there were no nations. There were no Gentiles. There were no Gentiles before chapter 11. Gentiles were formed when God divided humanity into nations by giving each nation its own language. Language defines nation. Territory of land defines nation. Constitution defines nation. And I could prove to you from Deuteronomy chapter 32 that God gave each nation its territory, not only its language, except the Americans. They took it from the Indians. <laughs> uh, so the nations were a creation of a result of the rebellion of humanity against God. And God wanted to start a new nation that was not under the same curse of the Tower of Babel. And that's why he chose Abraham and to make a new nation that was indigenous. That is the adoption. And if you want to see a parallel passage to that in Paul's writings, it's Romans 9, the first verse, it says, to them belongs the adoption to the Jews. Okay. So the adoption is not of the Gentiles, the adoption is of the Jews as the chosen people of God. But Paul, and I'm going to, I didn't write go the ahead, question, go but I'm yeah. going to be a lawyer for a minute and pay attention okay. to, the, to the preposition. Paul says that we were adopted, we were predestined, he predestined us unto adoption through dia, Iesu Christu, through Jesus Christ. That's right. So if he's talking about the Jews and Abraham, they were adopted through Jesus Christ? Yes. They were adopted through Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. And that Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world is the adoption that was predestined Predestined means from long time ago decided. Yeah? So the, the predestination of the election of Israel happened before the creation of the world when the Lamb of God was already prepared as medicine before the disease came into the world. Okay, lightning round. Are you ready? Yes. Was Paul married or not? Was married. Had to be to be on the Sanhedrin. I'll tell you, because he had to be married, but he says it about himself. If you study, read very carefully 1 Corinthians 7, you'll find three categories of people mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7. 
the unmarried, in Greek, agamos. Gamos means married. A reverses the action, like the ancola, seven up, right? <laughs> the ancola. So the agamos is the unmarried. And that's how it's translated into English. And you find the virgins, people who were never married. And you find the widows who were married and not married now in 1 Corinthians 7. And you see how the Apostle Paul pairs these groups. He pairs the unmarried with the widows, not with the virgins. And reading more carefully, I don't have the time now to go and read with you the text itself. Reading more carefully, you will see that Paul himself states about himself that he is unmarried. Now, how did he become unmarried? Did he beat his wife? No. He disappeared for 14 years in Arabia. According to Jewish law, if you abandon your wife six months and she doesn't hear from you, she is automatically divorced, free to remarry. And that law, Paul states very clearly in the same chapter, chapter 7, he says, if your husband abandons you, you're free. Go marry somebody else. Okay, as we continue the lightning round. Okay. <laughs> From your perspective, yeah. is it correct to understand two parts of this question? Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus, in who Jesus Yeshua is, and what he accomplished for mankind, part A. Then part B, does sanctification come from endeavoring to be Torah observant? So first, salvation by grace through faith in who Jesus is. Second, sanctification by observance of Torah. We have a very interesting verse in Paul's writings. Whom God called, he also enlightened. And whom he enlightened, he also sanctified. And whom he sanctified, he also justified. That is a progression. Contrary to what a lot of evangelicals think, that salvation is one moment in time in which you, a second before that you were not saved and a second after that you were saved, salvation is a process in the New Testament. It's a process that starts with faith. Now, if you believe right now, you walk out on the highway and a truck hits you and you die, you're saved. But if you continue to live, there are other steps other developments, other progression that you have to obey, that you have to continue. You have to confess, you have to repent, you have to be baptized, you have to get filled with the Spirit. You have to live a holy life, a godly life. All that is a part of the process of salvation. And so, yes, salvation starts with faith in Jesus Christ. You get a ticket to ride. You get on the train but you haven't gotten home yet until you die and you have lived a godly, obedient life. Now, you and I both took Greek under Professor Harvey Floyd, who has spoken in this very Pulpit. thema. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Dr. Floyd would, would uh, if he were here, he would take off his glasses, he would do his no, hand. No, he would go like that. Yes, he would. Yes, that's exactly what he would do. <laughs> Please understand, I had Dr. Floyd in 1980. He had him in the 60s. It never changed. <laughs> and he would tell us the Romans passage that salvation is from faith to faith. And he would take that, those careful prepositions of Paul to say it is from faith in the beginning to faith in the end. And it is always based on faith. And then he would take us to Galatians. I don't think you fuss with this, but I want to make sure it's clear. No, no, it's clear. I, I think he would take us to Galatians, where Paul says, Oh, who has bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? Did you start your salvation? Did you receive the Spirit by works of law, hearing with faith? Having begun that way, now why would you think it changes? You answered your own question. Okay. <laughs> Just make sure that I don't want someone to think that Joe Shulam stood up here and said, you're saved by faith, but then you have to work to keep it. No, you're saved by faith, but you have to live 
a godly life, an obedient life, a life of holiness and service. And you answered your own question when you quoted the text and used the pronoun you. Paul was talking to Gentiles who knew nothing, who didn't have the word of God. You guys have 10 Bibles in your houses. You have Bible in your iPhone. You have Bible on your iPad. You have Bible on your computer. People didn't have Bibles. The word of God was not so accessible. That's why Paul and the other apostles and the elders of Jerusalem recommended to the Gentiles to go on the Sabbath day to the synagogue where Moses is being read every Sabbath in Acts 15, 21. Yeah. So, yes, the Gentiles start with the faith and end with the faith. The Jews also start with the faith and end with the faith because the commandments are not enough anytime. Before Jesus came and was born in Bethlehem, the commandments were not enough because you can fake obedience. You cannot fake real faith. You can oh. fake <laughs> obedience, but you cannot fake real faith. Okay. But faith does not abrogate the necessity for obedience because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, very good. Okay, um, as we continue the lightning round. <laughs> how can you live as a Jew without a temple in Jerusalem? Very easy. Very easy. Jews lived all over the world even when the temple was erected in Jerusalem. There were Jews in Alexandria, like Philo and all, uh, a one million Jewish community in Egypt in that time. And there were Jews in Rome and there were Jews all over the world. They, the temple is an instrument. It's not an end within itself. Just like a church building is an instrument and not an end within itself. And we, when we had the temple, we misused it. When we had the temple, at times we brought idols into the temple like Ezekiel chapter eight states that they were worshiping Tammuz in the temple. The temple is not a solution, it is a means, it is an instrument. And we can live without a temple, but we cannot live without God, and we cannot live without the Messiah, without Yeshua. There was not a temple in the Torah. There was no temple in the Torah, and the temple, both according to Paul and according to rabbinical Judaism, the tabernacle was given in order to clean up the work of Aaron and the Israelites in making the golden calf. Before that, there was no hint of a tabernacle, of a temple, of an altar, of anything. Okay, we've whittled this down to a last couple. And I think a lot of people are gonna be interested, I, I have a lot of questions where people are interested in your views about other issues that are apart from what you've said, but are part of Paul and their issues that the church faces and questions that people have. So I've selected a couple of the more interesting ones to see if your Jewish perspective gives us any insight. When Paul refers to the thorn in his side, physical ailment or something else? Well, I went to school in Nashville, <laughs> like you did, and not one preacher but a few said that he was married. And that was the thorn in the flesh. <laughs> but I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Even though my wife is not here, I don't believe that. I believe he had problems with his eyes, and we see it in some of his letters. He says, what big letters I'm writing, and, and he had problems with his eyes. Um, and he already didn't have a wife, so that doesn't catch. Okay. Would you comment on Paul's statement of women keeping quiet in the church? Yes. <laughs> now that you've insulted. <laughs> no, no, saved from insult. Uh, uh, yes. If you read carefully, 
the text in 1 Corinthians 14. The context there is what happens in the public meeting of the saints. And the more specific context is what happens when somebody gets up to prophesy. That's, I think, in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 14. And then he says, let the women be silent in the church as it is the customs in all of our congregations. Okay. And his advice after that comes, let them go home and ask their husbands if they have any question, right? Which automatically takes every woman that is not married, a widow or, or a, a, a woman that is not married that doesn't have a husband, out of this formula. Because if they don't have a husband to ask at home, that text already doesn't apply to them. It only applies to women who have a husband that they can go home and ask him. But the, the, the Greek is simple. The, 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 the word gune in Greek means woman and it means wife. Same word. Like in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, isha means a woman and isha means my wife. Yeah. So he's not talking about all the women, he's talking about married women. And he's not talking about all the married women, he's talking about married women whose husband is preaching or prophesying and like Nancy Reagan, they want to go and whisper behind his head what to say. <laughs> That's the context of what's going on there. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a contradictory to what Paul writes in the same letter in the 11th chapter in the third verse, where he says, let the women cover their head if they pray or prophesy. If they pray or prophesy, they're talking. They're talking in the church. So that text in 1 Corinthians 14 cannot contradict the text in 1 Corinthians 11. So it doesn't mean every woman cannot say anything or ask a question because if you take that text literally, they can't even sing because singing is not keeping silent, right? So they cannot even sing and worship. So it doesn't make sense. What makes sense is talking to the women of those who are prophesying and preaching and telling them, don't bother your husband while he's preaching. Wait till you get home, ask him then. That's the only meaning of that text. Okay, last, last one, and I'm sorry if your questions did not get asked. We just, we've gone over time and, and I apologize. Um, what does it mean to be one with Messiah? Good question. Good question to end the other questions. We have a, a different concept in our modern evangelical Christian world of what it means to become a believer. But already in the gospel, we are called to unite with the Messiah. We are called to become one with the Messiah, to take up our cross like he took his cross and follow him. And both in Galatians 3 and in Romans 6, we are told that we die together with the Messiah in baptism and we raise together with him from the watery grave into a new life and we get filled with the Holy Spirit and we are baptized into Christ, both in Galatians 3 and in Romans 6 and in Romans 2. We are into Christ. What does it mean? It means, I'll give you from modern Judaism a very good example. We have Hasidic Jews. Have you, how many of you have heard of Hasidic Jews? Many of you have heard of Hasidic Jews. What does it mean, Hasidic Jews? Hasid means a disciple a person who follows his rabbi. Now, if you look at the Hasidic Jews, you can tell which rabbi they follow by which clothes they wear. They buy their clothes from the same shop, their hat from the same. 
Some of them, there's only one shop in the world that makes that kind of hats. It's in Hungary, on the border between Hungary and Romania. And every Hasid will spend $2,000, $3,000 to buy a hat from the same shop that the rabbi bought. They become one with the rabbi because they understand that following the rabbi, sticking with the rabbi, is the way that they can reach higher spiritual ground. I don't want to use Christian terminology, get saved, because they don't think in those terms. But they can reach higher spiritual ground and reach the ground in which their rabbi reached. And we're commanded to seek to reach the ground in which our Savior reached. That's what it means to be his disciples. The word disciple is used more than 200 times in the New Testament. The word Christian is used only three times, and none of the, none of the disciples ever called themselves Christians. Others called them Christians. Disciple, it means that you have a rabbi. Have a rabbi, it means you have a teacher. Have a teacher, it means you follow your teacher. You do what your teacher did because you want to reach the same height of relationship with the Almighty God as your rabbi did, as your savior did. That's what it means to be one with Christ. It means to follow him, to emulate him. Mm -hmm.